Up next, we're gonna go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year 1975, 47 years ago. This top 10 is some of the greatest songs of all time that we still hear today, and as usual, we have the actual artist telling us the stories. Now, who's the real number one all these years later? Is it the Doobie Brothers, is it the Eagles, or Grand Funk Railroad, or Stevie Wonder? Find out next on the Hit Song Redux. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever had a, a pet rock or a chia head or a Rubik's Cube, you're going to love this channel. It's nostalgia every time. Make sure to subscribe below right now to be a part of our music history daily, straight from the artist. You can also become an honorary producer and get more content on our Patreon. It helps us keep the music alive. You can click on the link in the description. You can also see our new merch there, including our brand new entries into the Vintage Years collection. Make sure to get your tickets to Professor of Rock Live, our event with a legend. It's time for another edition of our show, The Hit Song Redux. This is where we travel back to a week in the golden era of the rock and roll era. And we re-rank the top 10 songs of that specific week uh, based on how much the world has listened to them since their peak position on the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, we also have actual artist commentary in here. We have your stories, your dedication. Now to clarify, this is not my top 10. It's the actual top 10 from this exact same week, uh, 47 years ago. We count them down as they were then, and then we run them through this recalibration system which tells us what the real top 10 is based on the all-time streams and views since then. Uh, this program is really a, a tribute to the great Casey Kasem's American Top 40, which uh, I think we all grew up with. I never missed an episode. This time we travel back to this exact same week in the year 1975, 47 years ago. It seems like the 1950s. It doesn't seem like it's almost 50 years ago that it'd be the mid-70s. It's crazy. So if you wanted to catch a movie at this time at the local cinema, you would have to choose from uh, The Godfather Part Two. It is the motion picture masterpiece of the year my personal favorite movies ever, as well as uh, The Man with the Golden Gun, Roger Moore. You also had uh, Stepford Wives. A very modern suspense story from the author of Rosemary's Baby, who rated PG. And Shampoo with Warren Beatty. Lee Grant, Jack Warden, Tony Bill, Shampoo. On TV, Will of Fortune. Jack Woolery hosts Wheel of Fortune's Whirling Fun and Prizes, premiering Monday, January 6th. On and the Jeffersons. We are the Jeffersons. Both debuted in January. And uh, the show's Kung Fu and Odd Couple. Uh, both of those were in their final seasons. So let's get right into it. Coming in at number 10, it's a former Beatle with his eighth solo top 40 hit, John Lennon with Number Nine Dream. Dream away. Uh, so apparently John Lennon was fascinated with the recurrence of the number nine throughout his life. Uh, for instance, uh, Lennon was born on October 9th. His first home was at 9 Newcastle Road, Wavertree, Liverpool. Three names which each contain nine letters. Also, the Beatles' first gig at the Cavern Club took place on February 9th, 1961. Brian Epstein, the Beatles' manager, first saw them perform on November 9th of that same year. The Beatles' contract with EMI was confirmed on May 9th, 1962, and uh, the biggest nine event was Lennon's son, Sean, shared his father's birthday. So the mystery voice that calls Lennon's name, uh, John, during the first bridge was performed by his lover at that time, May Pang. On the second bridge, he reversed the tape of her saying his name. Music my soul. According to May Ping's book, Loving John, Lennon told her that he did not know what the song was about, but it wasn't about her. He also didn't convince her to sing the vocals. She sang them because the female vocalist that was actually scheduled for the session was a no-show. The song has had about uh, 36 million streams since its peak. Uh, 
Coming in at number nine is another solo song by an artist who is most prominent as the lead singer of one of the biggest groups of all time. It's Frankie Valli with the beautiful and poignant song, My Eyes Adored You. My eyes adored you. Oh, it was written by Bob Crew and Kenny Nolan, who had a big hit a few years later with I Like Dreamin'. It was originally recorded by the Four Seasons in early 1974, but after the Motown label balked at the idea of releasing it, the recording was sold to lead singer Frankie for uh, $4,000, I believe. After rejections by Capitol, Valley succeeded in getting the recording released on private stock recordings and eventually would go all the way to the top of the charts. So here's what co-writer Kenny Nolan said about the song. I'm such a title writer. When I hear a, a title that I love, it spurs melody to me. When I hear the, uh, the words, I hear, I hear the melody. The words come. Sometimes they come immediately, sometimes they come after a while. This song was very popular with our viewers. Uh, one of our viewers, Peter Kelly, said, My Eyes Adored You will always be a song for my mom and dad. And not only did they adore each other, but they loved Frankie Valley and must have seen the Jersey Boys show every time that it came to Glasgow. My mom passed away at the end of 2019. And if I hear this song, it takes me back to happy times and my mom and dad. So this song is dedicated to my mom, for sure. Screen name Dr. Uh, Hook Yeah, hope I got that right. He said, growing up in the late 70s and 80s, I dismissed the song My Eyes Adored You as a sappy 70s easy listening. As I grew older and heard the song with uh, any different perspective, it became one of my favorites. A classic about a man who worked hard to make it in show business, yet holds on to the memory of his first love. Another viewer, Michael Hull, said, I was madly in love and extremely shy in 1974 with a girl three years older than me. She would toy with me emotionally like a cat with a ball of string. She knew how I felt and graciously played along. It was a glorious five years, but the song My Eyes Adored You fit my experience to a T. I still love her. She will always be the one that got away, and that song will forever remind me of Brenda. Okay, so going into the number eight spot, it's uh, one of the last musical geniuses left on this planet, a man that does the impossible with his music. It's the great Stevie Wonder with Boogie on Reggae Woman. Boogie on Reggae Woman. At this point in his career, Stevie was in the midst of a monumental part of his, of his legendary career. Uh, a few years before this, he had negotiated a new contract, Motown, giving him complete creative control. What would follow after that were some of his greatest albums, some of the greatest albums in recorded history. I mean, there was Music of My Mind and Talking Book. Yeah, that was in 1972, Inner Visions in 73, Fulfilling This First Finale in 74, and Songs in the Key of Life in 76. In 74, he would uh, record constantly, keeping studio time booked wherever he was. Boogie Out Reggae Woman was one of many songs he put to tape, although it was uh, originally slated for his 1973 Intervisions album. His producer convinced him, though, that it was a better fit for fulfilling this, and it became uh, the second single. It went to number three on the pop charts. It also went to number one on the R&B charts. Ow. So this hit song Redux is sponsored by Zenny Eyewear, the style that I live by. Right now, you can get a brand new pair of glasses designed uh, to your liking for less than the cost of a vinyl record. Check it out today at zenny.com. Coming in at the number seven position, we have a song that was produced by legendary Beatles man George Martin. It's America with the Lonely People. This is for all the lonely people. This song was co-written by Dan Peake. I think he wrote it with his wife. Dan Peake, along with Dewey Bunnell and uh, Jerry Beckley, was one of the three original members of America. 
Uh, like I said, legendary Beatles producer George Martin produced this song along with uh, the rest of the album. This happened in London. The band met with George Martin in Los Angeles at the office of America's managers, Geffen Roberts. In an interview with Dan Peake, uh, he remembered it fondly. He said the first thing that George Martin did was he took off his shirt, sweater, and his shoes. Uh, he said it was too hot in L.A. He put everyone at ease at that point. We just got along uh, really well from the very first second. He has a very musical mind, and as we began working, we bounced ideas off of him quite a bit. Uh, things like vocal arrangements and guitar parts. It was an amazing experience working for a mind producer. End of quote. It's said that to Lonely People was written as a response, a positive response to a Martin Beatles' production, the elegant classic Eleanor Rigby. Look at all the lovely people. So moving on to the number six slot, we have the Ohio players with their hit, Fire. This song was a number one hit. Now lead Ohio player Leroy Sugarfoot Bonner, he talked about how Fire came to life in the studio. He said that we were in the studio making tracks and all of a sudden it leaped out. His bandmates came up with the title Fire and he ran with it. They come with the names and I have to write to them, to what he said. If the music is good, it doesn't take very long to get inspired. The song was recorded at Mercury Records, Chicago-based studio there. While performing it in California, the band let the aforementioned Stevie Wonder hear the basic track for the song, and he predicted that it would become a huge hit. Many of you probably know, uh, Wild Cherry's hit song, Play That Funky Music, was directly inspired by Fire. So halfway through the countdown at number five is a song by a band that dominated 70s rock radio, and then by the end of the decade, they had more of an R&B flavor to them, a more, more R&B sound. It's the Doobie Brothers with their great Southern track, Black Water. Black Water was a number one hit. It was a catchy sing-along classic that seems to entrance the masses, sung by Pat Simmons. This is what Pat and Tom Johnson had to say about the song in my interview. I remember going uptown, taking the, the streetcar, uh, St. Charles goes up into the Garden District. I had the riff, you know, the do 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 and I'd been trying to write a song, and I, nothing was really coming. And I was on the streetcar, and it started to rain. I started scribbling stuff down on some piece of paper I had, and... Uh, if it rains, I don't care. It don't make no difference to me. I'll take that streetcar that's going uptown. That was like one of the first things that I remember writing down about the song. That's what you were literally doing. <laughs> and, and, exactly. Well, if rain, I don't care. This song was also beloved by uh, our community. Viewer John Hampton said, I'd like to memorialize a friend of mine named Marty, who sadly committed suicide in 78. He was the nicest guy you would ever know, and he used to give a bunch of us a ride in his big old 1962 Chevy to high school every morning. Six or seven of us would be seen while we were on our way to school and smoking a little something. So that song always reminds me of him. Rest in peace, Marty. Well, we'll dedicate it to him for you. Screen name L.A. Smith Buxton said, My junior high art class was held in the industrial art shop building of our school. Uh, our art teacher liked to crank tunes while we were working on projects. So one day, Black Water started playing, and everyone just started singing along at the same time. We rocked it like crazy. When the song ended, he applauded us, and then the bell rang for the end of class. Perfect time. Yeah. 
Viewer Eric Warrington said, 23 years ago, my wife and I moved into our first apartment and we barely had anything moved in aside from a radio cassette player and a few other things. I'm checking things out and as I turn on the bathtub to check water pressure, Doobie Brothers Black Water comes over the radio as black water pours out of the faucet into the tub. Again, great stories here. Black water keeps rolling on past just the same. So let's go into the number four spot. Uh, this is where we have a band that was so big in their time that they sold out Madison Square Garden faster than the Beatles. A lot of Beatles references in this one. It's Grand Funk Railroad or Graham Funk as they were known at that moment, with their awesome remake, Some Kind of Wonderful. She's some kind of wonderful. She's some kind of wonderful. Some Kind of Wonderful was originally recorded in 1967 by an R&B group called the Soul Brothers Six. I don't need a whole lot of money. I don't need... So here's what former guitarist and singer Mark Farner said about it in our recent interview. Well, we were riding on the way to a gig, and we would always warm up our vocals a little bit. Andy Cavalieri, God rest his soul, he turned around and he says, what is that song you guys are, what is that song right there? He says, you guys need to record that song. I said, it's the Soul Brother Six, man, that's John Ellison. And he said, well, you guys need to do it. In fact, if you want to get people on a dance floor, start playing that song. Some kind of wonderful will bring them out. Coming in at number three, uh, it's one of the biggest bands in American history with a song that is on the biggest selling album of all time in America. Eagles with Best of My Love. Give me the best of your love. So Best of My Love, it's also a number one hit. It came uh, from the Eagles' third album on the border, uh, recorded in London with Glenn Johns, who had worked with them on their first two records. Only this time the band abandoned the sessions and they recorded most of the album with Bill Shimjic. Glenn Johns, he felt that the Eagles were an acoustic act and he helped them create multiple hits with that sound. You know, there's peaceful, easy feeling. Peaceful, easy feeling. Witchy woman amongst others. But the band, especially Glenn Fry, he thought that they should be writing more rock-oriented material as a rock band. Only this song was a, a leftover from the Glenn John Sessions and it ended up becoming the Eagles' first number one hit. Every night, I'm lying in bed. Now Don Henley said about the song, uh, this is kind of a long quote, but it's really good. He said, a lot of the lyrics were actually written in Dantana's at a booth we like to sit in on the front side of the bar area. J.D. Souther wrote the bridge and it was perfect. That was the period when there were all these great looking girls who didn't really want to have anything to do with us. Uh, we were just scruffy new kids who had no calling card. We were typical frustrated young men. We wanted the girls to like us, but we had all the immature emotions that uh, you know young men have. At the same time, however, we were also becoming quite adept at brushing off girls who showed any interest in us. If you want to be with me, I can't possibly give you the time of day. I want that girl over there who couldn't care less if I live or die. Hence the line in the Desperado, you only want the ones that you can't get. Only want the ones that you can't get. End of quote. This was another song that you all love. That same old crowd was like a gold cloud. Viewer Richard Dexter said, Oddly enough, even though Best of My Love was actually a breakup song, it was our song. While well, my then girlfriend and now wife dated and early in our marriage. Now together 45 plus years, so she still gets the best of my love and I still get hers. Well, Richard, we're going to dedicate this song to both of you. Viewer Kevin Stagg said, I've always thought Don Henley had one of the greatest and most unique voices in rock. I might add that's correct. I, I believe the same thing. Uh, back to his quote. As a musician and singer, I've always avoided doing his songs due to my belief that I would butcher them. Once while jamming with some musician friends, we were doing an Eagles mini tribute. And one of my buddies asked me to do Best of My Love. Naturally, I said no, but uh, he persisted and I finally relented. 
When the song was finished, my musician friends all clapped for my performance. I know that they were sincere since this is not something that they normally did. I was surprised, but looking back, I think that was the one time that I did justice to a Don Henley vocal. Back in time and it's a sweet dream. I agree, it's tough to do justice to a Don Henley vocal. Now, screen name The Truth said, uh, he said, the best of my love, was on constant Eagles shuffle on my dad's albums. The cover art was amazing. Uh, we bonded over the harmonies and him playing all the songs to help him get through him and uh, my mom's divorce. A bittersweet memory, but definitely a life-changing one. Again, I love these stories. It reminds me of my dad as well, big Eagles fan. So in at the runner-up spot, uh, one from number one is an instrumental. One of 13 instrumentals that would go to number one during the rock era. It's Pick Up the Pieces by Average White Band. What we're gonna do, pick up the pieces. Average White Band formed in 1972 and they released their first album, Show Your Hand, uh, the following year. After it failed to break through, the group shortened its name to AWB and released a self-titled album in 1974. This song was a surprise breakthrough number one hit for them. In 1974, their drummer and founding member, Robbie McIntosh, he uh, unfortunately died of a drug overdose at a Hollywood party. After recruiting their new drummer, AWB would have three more top 40 hits in the mid 70s and eventually revert to their original full name. But uh, they would decline in popularity and would end up uh, breaking up, uh, that happened in 1982. <laughs> But they have one that uh, touched the masses, has been used in so much pop culture. Okay, here we are at the number one spot. It's uh, from one of the most distinctive and recognizable voices of the rock and roll era. She seemed to perfect every genre that she attempted. It's Linda Ronstadt with You're No Good. Now, as many of you know, probably know, this song was around long before Linda Ronstadt took it to the top of the charts. Uh, it was first recorded by D.D. Warwick in 1963. Her version only went to number 117, though. Later, Betty Everett had uh, more success with her version. Went to number 51 in 64. And then the band Swing and Blue Jeans. <laughs> they took the song to number 97 in the US, but they did take it to number three in the UK where it became the best known rendition of the song. You're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good. Now, Linda Ronstadt began performing the song and she recorded it with her producer, Peter Asher. The song was a huge breakthrough for her later becoming uh, one of the biggest icons of the 70s uh, after that. I mean, Linda Ronstadt, amazing. Her big follow-up was also a cover song uh, from the Everly Brothers, When Will I Be Loved. When will I be loved? She actually performed You're No Good on the Midnight Special uh, like a year and a half before it hit number one. She added it to her concert repertoire from there. So at this moment in the Hot 100, there was a legendary song that wouldn't make the top 10, and I think we should include it in our recalibration. It's none other than Big Yellow Taxi by the great, the legendary Joni Mitchell. The original version only went to number 67 and 70, and then a live version went to number 24 and 75. Uh, this was written on Joni Mitchell's first trip to Hawaii. Uh, so she took a taxi to the hotel, and when she woke up the next morning, she threw back the curtains, and she saw these beautiful green mountains in the distance. And then she looked down, and there was a parking lot as far as the eye could see, and it, it just broke her heart. This blight on paradise. That's when she sat down and wrote the song. The day paradise put up a parking lot. So with that being said, here is the new top 10 based on all time streams. 
And number 10 is Lonely People by America with 24 million streams. This is for all the lonely people. And number nine, appropriately, it's number nine Dream by John Lennon with 36 million streams. Number eight is the Ohio Players with Fire, 40 million streams. And number seven is Linda Rodstadt with You're No Good with 43 million streams. So that means there's going to be a new number one hit. At number six is Frankie Valley with My Eyes Adored You with 45 million streams. Very close here. Number five, it's the Eagles with Best of My Love at 50 million streams. Give me the best of your love. And number four, it's Pick Up the Pieces by Average White Band with 71 million streams. What we're gonna do, pick up the pieces. And number three, it's Graham Funk with a remake of Some Kind of Wonderful with 72 million streams. She's some kind of wonderful. She's some kind of at number two, it's the Doobie Brothers with Black Water, 106 million streams. And at number one, drum roll please. At the number one position, it's a song that didn't even make the top 20. It's Joni Mitchell with Big Yellow Taxi with nearly 300 million streams. Hey, paradise, put up a parking lot. So there it is, the new top 10 from the first part of February 1975, based on all-time streams. So make sure to share your memories of these songs. What do you think about the number one position? How did it not even hit the top 20, but since 1975, it's the biggest? Share your thoughts on that. Now, if we didn't get to your uh, dedication or your memory, I promise we will. Share with us in the comments. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe to get these albums, we'll link to them. Check us out on Patreon, check out our merch. All this is about keeping the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.